The absolute dishonesty and fraudulence of most corporate mainstream media is now common knowledge. The rise of alternative and independent media over the last two decades has facilitated a mass awakening of people to the fact that we are systematically lied to and programmed into believing a false version of reality via the modalities of religion, education and mainstream media, all of which are controlled by a power elite via their various global intelligence networks. An important aspect into an individual's awakening to the true nature of our reality is their first step away from the mainstream media narrative and where they land. What is the true story of humanity's history? It's very different from what we've been taught in school. With over a decade as an independent investigative journalist, documentarian and author, moving in the world of alternative and independent media, and as co-founder and creative director of Conscious Consumer Network, I have personally encountered many individuals, groups and media outlets that put out sensationalistic false information. Whether or not they are aware, these purveyors of falsities are secretly serving the powers that be by continuously pumping confusing disinformation into the online world. We simply cannot create a better world on the back of lies. It is the drive to seek the truth and create a better world that motivates me to call out the scammers, frauds and charlatans that lie to and defraud vulnerable people with deliberately misleading information. Hi there, I'm here today with uh, Mel V and Vicky Boho and for many people that's going to come as a bit of a shock. Um, for many years, I guess for the past four and a half years since we've been running the Hoaxted Research blog. Um, we have not got on all that well necessarily with Biggie and, and Mel. And yet in the background recently, um, we began discussing um, some of the things that we actually do have in common. And one of those things is an interest in where repressed memories and allegations of satanic ritual abuse come from, how do they form, who is interested in uh, promoting them, and why. So we discovered that we actually could put our heads together and learn from one another, and I think that's a valuable thing. Um, I do think it's important for people to understand the point of view of people that they don't necessarily always agree with. And so here we are today. Um, and I know that that's going to raise quite a few eyebrows. And that's okay, too. You can probably tell us about it in the comments section. We've been talking about kids and adults who have made claims of uh, sexual, r r sorry, satanic ritual abuse, and who have come to that realization or that understanding of their lives via working with certain therapists, counselors, whatever. And we noticed that there seems to be a kind of commonality and that there are a lot of links amongst all of the various people um, who are promoting this idea. Because as anyone knows, if you are in the journalism business or in the business of trying to uh, track down what's going yes. on, the first rule is follow the money. So there we go. So over to you, Mel. Thanks, Karen. So good to do this piece with you. And I do want to touch on the point that, you know, we haven't always seen eye to eye on uh, various causes and we don't even necessarily share the same opinions about what may uh, be real or not real. One thing that, however, I have found commonality with you in is that first off, you are an excellent researcher and you're, you're quite, um, analytical, you're not emotionally attached to any outcome when you look at this information. And that's a key uh, research investigative skill that I think is perhaps missing from a lot of the people that we've worked with, bearing in mind that Biggie and I have run Conscious Consumer Network now for almost five years. And during that time, we've had a vast plethora of people who've come on uh, as either broadcasters, um, that we provide broadcasting services to, professionally edited and, and broadcast uh, through various channels. And then of course, those broadcasters themselves bring on various guests. 
Now, what's been interesting to note is that uh, certain broadcasters will always bring on the same type of guests, like people who, for example, are very much uh, a believer of the Hampstead case, uh, the true believers, as you like to title them. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll notice that there's a theme and a commonality with the sort of people that then come on as guests onto their show. Many of them have in some way been involved in perpetuating uh, various hoaxes, but also there's a number of people who've come out claiming to be ritually abused, um, satanically ritually abused or ritually abused in some form through some sort of religious construct, um, cult ideology. And um, what's very sad is that, you know, all of this creates so much confusion for people. And there's a lot of very well-meaning people. And I, I guess myself, I was one of them at, at a certain point, you know, jumped on the bandwagon of this and went, wow, this is horrendous. This is stuff really going on. Because, mm -hmm. it, you know, any decent moral person would be utterly shaken to the core to um, be confronted with some of the details, particularly with that which was disclosed to us in the Hampstead case. Yeah. Um, however, the, the problem was that as a journalist, you have to be realistic and put the emotions aside and go, yes, this is horrendous. And, you know, to a certain extent, I do not doubt that somewhere in the world some of the stuff goes on. I'm from Africa. We've got a ritual muti killings there. That's something that um, happens that we know of within the culture. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily have to say that it's, uh, um, that can be used to justify that kind of cultural behavior that I'm used to from where I grew up is necessarily to justify the, the what seems to be the latest iteration of falsehoods that people have seized upon um, for a number of different reasons, and we will explore those, but they've seized upon it, yes, for uh, notoriety, fame, and therefore money, and whatever other egoic or, or deep, dark holes within themselves they're trying to fill. There's a number of places we can go with the why they do this. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the truth is that these people who are coming out with these false claims, let's just say that if there are people who are generally being abused in cult situations, and we know there's some very well-documented cases and things like Scientology um, and all sorts, varying degrees of abuse, psychological abuse, physical abuse, perhaps mm -hmm. even sexual abuse, as is the case of the Catholic Church. The problem is that the fakers, what they do is they actually uh, create a climate of non-believers because there's been so many hoaxes now that anybody who has a genuine claim is probably too afraid to come out and say anything mm -hmm. because they don't want to be a subject to the same climate and and, and uh, attacking and disbelief because it's a hard enough thing to deal with if you've gone through those sort of experiences yeah. but then to have to deal with the onslaught of people who perhaps pick fault at it now, mm -hmm. the problem with a lot of these things is, is that there's not enough supporting evidence. And that's where we as journalists have to sort of draw ourselves back and go, okay, yes, we felt that emotional charge. Yes, perhaps they were believable, but what is the supporting evidence? You look at the information that's been given and the investigations that's been done and a lot of places and things and specific details just never materialized or weren't there. And that's been yeah. the common theme, which has brought about, I suppose, a lot of shining into dark places the light of truth about these dark stories that have been put out and there's so many examples and as we go through it we'll show you just exactly how the same patterns tie into each story because basically when you start to pick a pick it apart and you realize the same deceptions are there for everybody where it's rooted how it's evolved and the patterns that kind of sort of proliferates all these things you begin to see exactly you know, how this entire construct has really come from a very small handful of people and, and spread into a, a, a real sick psychosis of people who believe in an iteration of abuse that simply does not exist. Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't exist altogether, but the, the ones that we'll be discussing today are people that I think have either categorically been proven to be fakers in either, as either... Um, have been abused or in other areas, uh, professional areas, um, or people who have um, actively involved themselves in supplanting ideas such as implanting memories into people's heads. And that's uh, a whole other area we'll get into with regards to the therapeutic aspect of this. Mm -hmm. So Karen, where do you want to start with this? 
Well, I think maybe a good place to start is with the, the where it all began um, in the early, well, in actually 1980. Um, there was a book called Michelle Remembers. Um, interestingly, the book was written by a psychiatrist and his ex-patient, uh, Michelle Smith. The, the, the psychiatrist's name was Lawrence Pazder. And they lived in a, I wouldn't say small town, but a small city on the west coast of Canada called Victoria. Um, I happen to know Victoria quite well because that's where I was born and grew up for the first 10 years of my life. Um, so it's, and it's a place that I've returned to from time to time. It's quite a lovely little city. Not the kind of place that you would expect to find a bunch of, you know, crazed Satanists running around stuffing children into graves and so forth. Um, I would not, okay, I, I do think that the concept of satanic ritual abuse um, developed in that particular story. Um, and we know that the story is false for a number of reasons. One is that when Michelle, the, 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 the main character, uh, goes through a whole bunch of horrible tribulations and is tortured and burned and cut and all sorts of things. And then at the end of the book, in this amazing denouement, um, the Virgin Mary appears and heals her of all her wounds. And therefore, she can't, doesn't have any wounds to show anyone to, to prove that any of this happened. Um, that's a bit of a clue because the Virgin Mary doesn't normally make house calls. Um, and I believe Jesus puts in an appearance as well. So this had to do, it, it, that clearly shows uh, the religious beginnings of the concept of satanic ritual abuse. And that was where the term was first used. Um, they, the two of them, Pazder and Smith, made a career out of selling this idea. And they made a fair bit of money at it. They did appearances on television and, you know, Oprah and all of that stuff. But they were not the first people to talk about uh, repressed memories and to talk, and to talk about or to talk about uh, groups of Satanists doing horrible things. Although the earlier discussions generally didn't involve sexual abuse so much as physical and and emotional abuse, like forcing people to eat, you know. Um, corpses and that sort of thing. That began in the, in the, early, in the 70s with people like Mike Warnke, who was a, uh, claimed to have belonged to a satanic cult, was later found out not to have. And he spread the idea that satanic cults were among us, that we had to watch all the time, that, uh, and this was, he was, he went on the Christian speaking, you know, speaking circuit he was a very, very entertaining and high energy speaker, and a lot of people believed what he said. So if you marry that with the, mer the emerging idea that memories could be repressed and then dug up somehow, um, then you, you kind of come up with Michelle Remembers, and that, is th that book kind of took place at that junction. Um, so after that, the concept of satanic ritual abuse took off. I remember as a young social worker when I first met my first alleged satanic abuse victim, I completely believed everything she said, even things that were physically impossible, like for example, that they uh, taught the children how to fly. Um, she would say, you know, she would say quite seriously, you know, yes, they, they taught us, you know, as, as a way of getting away from the people who were looking for us, we had to learn how to fly so that we could leave the premises quickly and not leave any trace of ourselves behind. That, again, is a bit of a clue, but I, I took it at the time as some kind of metaphor for something that she was trying to tell me. It didn't occur to me until I actually went looking for the name of the person that she claimed had abused her and discovered there was no such person. And then other things began to come up. There was no such place as many of the places that she had mentioned to me. And by the, I would say by the middle of the 1990s, when I was, you know, working full time as, as a social worker, when I ran into allegations of satanic ritual abuse, which were few and far between, but occasionally they would happen. Usually 
it was because that person had been to see another counselor and that other counselor had helped them remember. This is a bit of a clue as well. When it takes a counselor to help you remember something that happened in your childhood that you've had no recollection of, and you have to be persuaded as a client that this happened, that's not really something that you want to go to. That's not a memory. That's just basically an implanted memory. And I won't say that, that all therapists who do this are doing it deliberately either. Sometimes it's, okay, tell me about, you know, tell me about the, um, the time they hurt you. Oh, did they use, um, you know, I don't know, did they, what, what, would, what do Satanists use? Did they use blood? You know, tell me about the blood. And don't, just relax, just try to remember, try to remember. And if you look at certain types of therapy, for example, EFT is, is a very common one right now, which stems from a discredited type of therapy called EMDR, uh, eye movement uh, desensitization and reprocessing. And this kind of EFT is associated with tapping. The idea is that you tap on certain special points on a person's body, and this causes them to invoke memories. In the instructions for how to help someone who doesn't remember their trauma, it literally says, make something up. Like I actually found a page where it said, if, you, if your client um, doesn't have any memories of their own, you can just suggest, um, make up a story. This is the first one. Here are eight that you can experiment with. Have the client simply invent a story and tap on it. There it is. Yeah, there it is. Pull yeah. up on the share screen. Great, wonderful. Um, yeah, have them have the client. The reason this is so effective is that imaginary uh, stories have to come from somewhere. Yes, your imagination, and the elements a client uh, selects reside in his or her consciousness. So the made-up story is inevitably going to contain elements of actual situations. That's not true. If I write about Goldilocks and the three bears. Does that mean I believe that talking bears, you know, live in a house that and a little girl came and tried out their beds? I don't think so. So, you know, and then, or tap on a disturbing scene from a movie. So literally, you can get a person to remember that something from a movie that they might have found distressing. Well, I find a lot of things in movies distressing. I don't like violent movies. Does that mean that every violent thing that happens in a movie is something that happened to me personally? I don't think so. So these are some of the techniques. And I think that they are used a lot of the time by well-meaning therapists who really want to help their clients and think that this is a good way to do so. Um, I do think that it's very, very dangerous. And Mel, you were, have been talking to me about some of the techniques that you had experienced um, with some some therapists that that you know that you came into contact with. So maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this is actually very interesting because I'm, I'm looking at this article and I've just noticed now for the first time. Um, it says Dawson Church. Ironically, um, the therapy that I had, the EFT tapping therapy and I have the whole lot, tap on the cheek, tap on the chin, you know, tap over here, tap on this finger. And it was the whole repertoire whilst you're repeating certain mantras. And the person that trained me was a lady by the name of Joanne Lomax. She was, she didn't train me, she um, gave me therapy, I should say. The person who trained her was a gentleman by the name of Carl Dawson. And interesting that this is Dawson Church mm. here. But, you know, I don't know if it comes from the church of Carl Dawson or what, but he is the big EFT trainer in the UK that trains all the supposed top EFT therapists. Mm -hmm. He's just training one woman in a form of memory reimplanting therapy called matrix reimplanting. Um, I've given her a full course and she's now the therapist uh, backstage at Glastonbury. I, I won't mention her name because she's irrelevant to this conversation, but he is, he's the person who trains all these people go out and do all these like sort of glamorous therapy jobs um, at, at various places. And, it's, uh, I I've actually have seen how pernicious this little circle is that, that goes around and myself having actually been subject to EFT, um, I had 
many sessions with Joanne Lomax, who learned from Cole Dawson. And I found it initially, the tapping, um, when you're talking about things that are traumatic for you, what it's like is it gives you a, a momentary emotional charge release. It does. It, it releases the, the, what you're doing is you're bringing these memories back. So you, as you're talking about them and you're focusing on them, you're actually bringing them into a heightened emotional state. Mm -hmm. And then the tapping is supposed to lessen that heightened emotional state. Mm -hmm. And I use the analogy of um, that EFT is in fact like um, going for a massage, mm -hmm. yeah? So you've got a little bit of a crick in your neck, you go for a massage and it's, it feels really good while you're having the massage. But the moment you're back in the real world, sitting at your desk doing work, I get that same little crick in my neck because I'm you know, constantly looking at the screen and, and writing and you know, my posture's not as good. So it's a momentary thing. It doesn't necessarily per se have long-term effects. I think if you did a lot of it, there would still be that what I call the, 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 the massage feeling. Yeah, you've given yourself a massage, but if there's something really, really wrong deep down inside, like you've got some sort of psychosis, this isn't the kind of therapy that's going to get down to the inside. Like if you had cancer, mm -hmm. per se, it's not necessarily going to get down to the inside and remove the cancer and uh, detox your body if that's, was, if that's your problem, you, you've got a bad lifestyle. There's more... Um, direct and active approaches you need to take to treating things like psychosis, to treating toxicity from bad lifestyle, whatever. Mm -hmm. A full body massage isn't going to necessarily give you the relief from every deep set ailment within you, yeah. psychological, physiological, otherwise. And this is what EFT is. It's like a massage. So yes, it's a lovely therapy. If you're the kind of person who has time to go spend with someone who wants to you know, get you to tap on different parts of your body, you know, there's various ways you can do this um, from an on-screen sheet. You don't even need to go to a therapist. You just pull up a video. It's like doing yoga at home. You can go to yoga classes or you can put a video up and do yoga in your lounge. Yeah. So it's not necessary that it's therapist-led. However, there is a huge amount of an absolute influx of EFT-trained therapists. You just have to look at how many courses someone, just one therapist in the UK, Evelyn and Carl Dawson, how many people attend each of the seminars. Each person that attends a seminar gets full training and comes out with I'm a therapist certificate. Mm -hmm. These therapies aren't even necessarily recognized or promoted by the um, oversight bodies um, of psychi psychiatry or psychology within the UK for a start. Mm -hmm. certainly not here in Europe yeah. and there's no oversight body to regulate these therapists or in fact um, where you can file complaints uh, within the UK if therapists who aren't registered and aren't accredited therapists are providing therapies which could perhaps cause some further psychological damage because they're pseudo therapies as opposed to be uh, you know, proven and, and tried and practiced and recognized therapies that are approved by some kind of uh, psychotherapy ombudsman. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can see how a person could develop that kind of, um, you know, so, some memories that didn't really happen. You know, if you're, if yeah. you're, you know, you're thinking about, all of the bad things in your life, you're sort of trying to bring them up so that you can be tapped upon. Um, and the next thing you know, you're remembering, quote unquote, um, someone in a robe coming at you with a bowl of blood. You know, it's, 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 it, you can be prompted into remembering things. And this, to me, this was very reminiscent of what happened, for example, during the McMartin trial in the United States, uh, in California, um, children, and one of the children there actually said, I would remember anything they wanted me to remember. Because basically the therapists there, the social workers, took the children and interrogated them and gave them ideas about what might have happened, what must have happened, what they thought happened. And they wound up getting the children to claim that they had been taken on, you know, on flying, flying saucers and, and that, you know, that people had ridden broomsticks and, and that, you know, they had been buried in, in, you know, in graves and all sorts of crazy, crazy, crazy stuff because it was suggested to them by the adults. Now, the sad thing is a lot of the children from the McMartin trial who are now adults still live with those memories because memory is not 
as we, we think of memory as being like um a like a reel like a, a film reel where it's just something it's imprinted in your brain and it's there forever memory is very 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 plastic it moves and changes and every time we discuss a memory for example we put a new value into it and we slightly change it and you'll notice that people will sometimes tell you a story that they told you 10 years ago and it will have morphed into something kind of a little bit different that's because we don't mem they're not being dishonest necessarily but we don't necessarily always remember things exactly the way they happened and people can remember things that didn't happen i remember seeing a car underwater and I don't remember where that came from, but I'm 100% sure that it didn't happen because the place that it happened was seems to have been some kind of a jungle. And I know for a fact that I have never been to a country that has any kind of jungles. So to me, that feels like a memory, but it's not, you know, it's just, it's just something in my mind that kind of got there by accident. And that's how a lot of stuff works. It goes back to the Freudian idea that Freud had the the idea that people experienced uh, abuse and then repressed it there's actually very little evidence to show that people repress bad memories there's a lot more evidence to show that when we when bad things happen to us we remember them quite vividly and they become intrusive um we have intrusive flashbacks that's generally the you know um, people have begun to realize that that's how the brain works that it's very, very complex and not everyone has that, you know, that experience. There are probably some things where we lose consciousness or go into a fugue state, but that's very, very rare. Um, so yes. you're much more likely to highly remember and have a very emotionally charged remembrance of something happening than you are to have a memory that disappears. That Absolutely. Have an important memory that disappears. God knows, I can't remember where I left my keys, but you know. It's, it's absolutely the way the human body and psycho psychological makeup is made, is that, you know, um, say we meet somebody and we have a, a great time with them uh, three or four times, and then something really bad happens, um, we see them very drunk and abusing someone. The likelihood is that we will remember that a moment where we saw him drunk and abusing someone over the four amazing times that, or, or whatever that we had before. Yeah, that is standard. The yeah. mind is, it's, it's because of our survival mechanism. We are programmed to remember things which are dangerous mm -hmm. and which that, you know, we learn, okay, yeah, don't touch that hot plate because guess what? You, you burnt yourself once, you know, now that's dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Right? That is how we are, we develop our um, survival mechanisms. So our brain is actually trained to remember yeah. the things that might cause us harm so that we can avoid it in the future. Yeah, that is exactly. how we survive. It's our fight and flight mechanism. It's inbuilt into our psychology. So I also have a really hard time with the whole repressed memory thing. Mm -hmm. And myself having done this matrix re-imprinting re therapy, again, I was uh, given matrix re-imprinting therapy by Joanne Lomax, who was a broadcaster on our network. And um, I got to see firsthand exactly what this therapy was, was, was all about. So I'm a firsthand experiencer and this is my view on it. Having looked at it and really started to research it and go into, you know, when, when, when I had it, I, I felt uncomfortable. First thing that came out of there thinking was, I did not feel that I would ever find benefit from doing that again. My secondary feeling was, because at that time I still had an emotional attachment to Joanne Lomax was, mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is, I find this to be unethical. That was my um, initial thing was, I find this to be unethical because the repertoire in which I was given during my supposed therapeutic state was, um, I was told to imagine a scenario um, with an abusive family member, because I had an, an abusive family member, mm -hmm. Um, but now I had to imagine a scenario where I was rewriting what happened by superimposing a memory onto it, which I would imagine into that scenario where instead of that person who 
hit me at the time actually came to me and told me that they loved me and they accepted me for what I was, mm. taking my hands and looking me deep in the eye. Now, that was a superimposed scenario. And, you know, as well-meaning as it may be, because a lot of these therapists are very well-meaning and very naive. They take these courses and they think, oh, yeah, I'm going to heal the world. I'm going to help people. And that's all very good. I mean, that's a different kind of messianic narcissism that we can get into because for some people it goes to some extreme. Yeah. But a lot of them come in with the idea of they want to help, they want to heal. And this is a therapy that they think can perhaps help people. But... I, I wonder how many of them actually stop to consider the ethics and implications of putting false memories or false scenarios into people's heads. Mm -hmm. because at mm -hmm. The moment I had that, even though it was a very well-meaning scenario and the therapist who did it to me at the time, I'm sure meant absolutely no harm. She was completely intending to try and give me some relief from mm -hmm. past traumas during this life. Mm -hmm. um, I came out of that going, I'm not doing that again. And that is unethical. Yeah. I'm a savvy enough person to know what is right and what is wrong and everything about it in my gut when that is wrong. I can't believe that goes on. And that was my first introduction, really. Bearing in mind that I've always been a believer in the satanic ritual abuse narrative for a very long time. It's not that I don't believe it doesn't go on. Mm -hmm. I just believe that there's a lot of evidence to, to prove that many of the supposed ritual abuse cases have been implanted or suggested by therapists. There's it's a long list and corresponding and instances which, and I've now having experienced myself how this is done, I absolutely see how it could have played out, how many of these people who have come forward as supposed abuse victims have had these, um, or, or who claim they've had repressed memories have now brought to the surface. Yeah. Um, I also find it highly unlikely because I myself have been through a, a scenario, uh, many scenarios as a child. I wish I could forget that. I wish I could repress yeah. those memories. Yeah. And yeah. that yeah. they actually still haunt me, actually. I, I haven't been able to repress or forget them. In fact, I went to a therapist to have uh, a scenario imprinted um, that would make it seem, those some of those um, instances would make it seem better. Mm. But uh, upon getting those therapies, I absolutely realized that then they're not right and they can be misused and abused and i think maybe unknowingly or, or ignorantly but i think some some people definitely knowingly are using this as a money making scheme because mm -hmm. if i could tell you just how much money i have seen in the realms of satanic ritual abuse yeah. victims mm -hmm. and and funds that are made available for these people oh, yeah. um and you know it's it's insane the, the so, concept that you're talking about with the matrix re-imprinting, I, I find that very, very scary because what you're basically doing is you're trying to teach the person that a person who, you know, that an abusive situation really is okay, that it was safe and, and, and that, that they really had your best interests at heart. And now you've got, you're going around with two conflicting pieces of information and which one's going to win, you know? Exactly. If you think that the person who abused you really had your best interests at heart. How is that going to mess up the way that you process um, the way that you were abused? I mean, that's, it's just so wrong. That's, there's so many things about that, that are just wrong. You know? Absolutely. When I approached the therapist about this and I explained to her, look, I do not want, I basically said to her, I appreciate your therapy. I don't want it anymore because I do not want false memories in my yeah. head. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as, as we rewrite um, our memories, we, we actually lose reference points for ourselves, for our own development. And, you know, we need the good things and the bad things in our life because life in contrast is a beautiful thing. You know, you need the good and the bad to, and the relationship between the two, the good and the bad things that happen to you in life and your growth and your journey in between them. You know, every bit of that adds to who you are and where you eventually end up and the, and the choices and decisions you make. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be making my decisions based on real information and experience rather than making my choices of, of, of decisions based on information that that was perhaps um, made up and then implanted into my head. And in yeah. fact, is a false memory. It's Absolutely. a scenario that never happened and that won't ever happen. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, it's, I, I think it's very irresponsible for these therapists to be pushing this kind of therapy when it's, 
I don't, I don't see how long term it can be beneficial. It just creates a false idea of, of yeah. certain aspects of one's life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I know. When I think about implanting memories, of course, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is recent, you know, in, in recent history is, is the Hampstead children um, and how Abraham basically, Abraham and Ella basically worked to try to convince them that their version of reality was the correct one. Um, fortunately for the children, they were rescued before that really took hold. And they, and at least, especially the older one was able to say, no, that was all lies. The younger one was still a little doubtful until, you know, until, until, you know, at, you know until probably sometime afterwards. But yeah, it's, it's scary stuff. You can actually change memory and it's really disturbing to find that people are trying to do this deliberately and knowingly um it's one thing to say you know well some criminals did this to children in morocco it's another thing to say it happened in a therapist's office that's really disturbing um yeah it is disturbing and i just want to bring up a share screen quickly before we go on to the flow path and how all of these people are connected so that you can actually see some of what um we're looking at here because there's been a number of people Okay, a huge number of people who have come forward with supposed claims. A number of them have had huge financial benefit out of it. They've created quite a big celebrity for themselves. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that their motivations were pure or, mis or that their, their, their facts were mistaken. I think they were very well aware of what they were doing and what they are doing. Okay, yeah. so uh, I've got a little list of people here. Obviously, um, one of the I was the first journalist to come out and say, look, the Holly Gray case is a hoax. Mm -hmm. There were a number of little um, people pulling in bits of information that started a website. They came to me and sat me down and presented to me and I looked at this and then I spoke to um, Sylvia Major and Wynne Dragon Smith personally. And once you've spoken to these two ladies, it is almost impossible to believe that these two sweet little old ladies um, would sexually abuse a, 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 an underage girl who has Down syndrome. I mean, that's pretty, a pretty sick thing to do. Yeah. I just didn't, I did not feel that these two ladies had the capacity to do such a thing. Yeah. Okay? yeah. Not at all. Yeah. Then and they, and when I found out that Valerie Sinison was involved, uh, that's a bit of a clue. <laughs> But you want to elaborate on that? Oh, she apparently was called upon to do a, um, um, Valerie Sinison is, is, sorry, let me back up a second here. My brain is moving faster than my mouth. Um, the Valerie Sinison is a therapist in London who is one of the major for, driving forces behind belief in not only satanic ritual abuse, but in repressed memories and re memory recovery and that sort of thing. Um, and she was brought into the Holly Gregg case. Uh, I know that she was called upon to give Anne Gregg a psychiatric evaluation. And guess what? Anne Gregg came through with flying colors and, and you know, was basically the, the sanest person that Valerie Sinison had ever met. Lovely lady. Um, and yet, the next thing you know, people are being accused of satanic ritual abuse around, you know, around Holly, her daughter, when it had actually just started out with an, with quote unquote simple allegations of sexual abuse, which may or may not have been true, but those were completely obscured by the allegations of satanic ritual abuse. Once you get into SRA, Everything else goes by the wayside and any actual abuse which might have occurred is dropped and forgotten about because it's seen as less important or less extreme or somehow just not as valuable in terms of probably publicity, I suppose, um, to the people who are making the claim, you know, it's it. And that actually raises a whole other issue of how SRA damps down real allegations of child sexual abuse, which then become, become kind of relegated to second class, uh, second class status. And people who have just, quote, just been sexually abused feel as though they don't have very much to say because they weren't abused by, you know, crazy Satanists with bowls of blood and stuff. 
you know and, and you yeah know. there's been an, and the thing is it is it, it's such a it's still to me beggars belief that anyone would make up a story about this kind of abuse mm -hmm. and the, the thing is that if i hadn't experienced this kind of coaching firsthand Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's it's been the case with uh, Anne and Holly. Uh, we've seen all the evidence with regards to Ella Drake and Abraham Christie and the two kids from Hampstead. Mm -hmm. One of the key cases that I dealt with in my early days as a journalist, I think this is back in 2013, when I was still um, um, promoting Kevin Annett, and um, he came to the Netherlands, and one of the ladies that came to one of his lectures, and of course, you know, Kevin Annett hasn't got the best reputation with the work he's done, and... He had a lady come to one of his lectures by the name of Toast Nyenhaus, who I personally interviewed several times. I interviewed a daughter, and after in, I published the first interview, but I had probably six more that I did not publish because the more I worked with them, the more I began to compare their stories, the more I realized there were big plot holes, there were big inconsistencies, and eventually I had to come out and say, Look, um, in one instance, I actually saw, witnessed firsthand. This young girl who was only 15, Carmen was her name. Um, she's now over age, so I don't feel too bad mentioning her. But mm -hmm. um, at the time, she was being shouted at by her parents for getting her lines wrong. And in the third interview we did with Carmen, we had to do three takes because the mom wasn't happy with the first two versions because she said it wasn't right. Um, the second time we saw her send her daughter to the room to learn her lines, That's exactly yeah. what she said. And the wow. third time the mother sat in the room with us, literally mouthed to the daughter what she had to say. Mm -hmm. First two, we, we made sure that we got the mother out of the room, but you know, after not being happy, we would just let him the third time, let her in to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. so by this mm -hmm. time, by the third take, we were getting suspicious of why she wasn't happy with the version of events her daughter kept giving us. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing was very fishy and um, unfortunately it was a very hard thing for me to do because you know, I had grown uh, an emotional attachment being a real empathetic person. I think sometimes it can be a weakness because I'd grown really attached and felt, felt really sorry for these two people but I, could also, I also knew deep down inside that what they were doing wasn't right. Mm -hmm. The story they were giving me was flawed, um, inconsistent and I had personally witnessed the mom shouting the daughter, coaching her to learn the lines. And then I witnessed the mother mouthing the words to her daughter during the third interview. And the daughter's account didn't match with hers, which is why she got the second two interviews done. When you start putting that all together, no matter how attached and empathetic you are, you have to look at this objectively, which is what I had to do as a journalist and go, well, first off, there's absolutely no supporting evidence for any of these claims. Secondly, I think I absolutely did. No, I don't think. I absolutely know. I witnessed uh, a young girl being coached by her mother. Yeah. And even mm -hmm. if the mother's story is true, I, I now don't trust the mother at all. Okay? <laughs> even though I published yeah. the first interview, I don't trust mm -hmm. the mother's version at all because of the strange uh, behavior I observed between the two. And then you start working with all these other people. Of course, they come onto our network and everyone claims that they've been richly abused, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we've had so many of them. Okay. Angela Power Disney, of course, everybody who watches your stuff and who Angela is. Yeah. From Angela, she brought on a, a lady called Sandy Berg. And, and this woman should never have been on the screen because she's, she was, um, I think, a, a drug addict her whole life, an alcoholic, but when she came onto our network and mm -hmm. really had psychological issues um, really badly. She's probably one of the craziest people we've worked with. And from, from Sandy Berg, and ironically enough, um, because Sandy was a guest on network, then came on as a broadcaster. When Sandy was a broadcaster, she brought on Joe Lomax, mm -hmm. who, who came on as a guest and then became a broadcaster with us for two years. And we'll get on to, uh, when we do the flow screen, we'll talk a bit about Joe Lomax and all the people that we, we've had to observe, which is how we've come to this point of seeing this pattern um, of these people. Now, interestingly enough, one of the people that was brought on Time Network as a guest through uh, Joe Lomax was a lady by the name of Ann Redolfs. Mm -hmm. Joe was a lady who gave me all the therapies that I went for. Hang on a second, something wrong here. Ann Redolfs is one of her guests, claims to be sexually, satanically, ritual abused. Um, I don't believe any of her claims. We worked with her behind the scenes in various projects. We got to see for ourselves that this woman is a complete fantasist. 
and you know she claims also to be a therapist but she was apparently deregistered or not registered with any of the oversight bodies because she didn't agree with them with regards to certain things you know well no the guidelines are there for us to adhere to you can't just disagree with them and still think you're a therapist yeah no that's right and then of course there's there's uh, Carl Beach who you know it's one of the most famous cases now because the police yeah. spent almost five million investigating this guy mm -hmm. supposed to make, um, and he's now gone to jail. The latest one um, which has come up, I think very strikingly similar to the Hampstead case. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is the King's um, with the King's College or King's School in London, Aria and Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And then. You know, uh, we've had others from abroad, uh, such as Fiona Barnett in Australia, which, you know, we had Fiona Barnett on our network. She mm -hmm. was interviewed by two different people. Mm -hmm. And one of the best researchers we've ever had on our network is a guy called Jan Irving. And, he's a, and he, he basically outed Fiona Barnett in a big way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of the things with Fiona is that she, first of all, her claims are bizarre. But secondly, what I have noticed is that she has a kind of an army of supporters and she mobilizes them whenever anyone says anything against her. Um, so I actually had the experience, I was approached by someone, someone I probably wouldn't normally speak with. I mean, he was, he seemed to be, um, you know, promoting uh, various different American um, conspiracy theories that I thought were kind of off the wall, but he had somehow worked, you know, he had had got in touch with someone that Fiona told him to get in touch with to validate her story. The person that he got in touch with said, no, she's full of shit. And when he came out with this, he was savaged. Absolutely. It was, it was just crazy. Um, so that gives you some idea. I think two things. One is, one motivation for these for for the SRA claimants, I think, um, if they're doing it consciously and if they are aware that they are basically just making shit up, I think one of the big um, benefits for them is a sense of community and having a group of people who will believe your every word, no matter what kind of nonsense you come up with. For example, Lauren Stratford, the lady at the bottom of the list, she was, she's actually kind of a, she, she died in 2002. So she's, you know, she's long gone. But once she gave up and was outed as not really satanically ritually abused, she laid low for a little while. And then she came back with a different name, Lauren Grabowski, as an alleged survivor of the death camps in Europe in, in the Second World War. And she, you know, mooched off that for a while. I think for the for for people like her, one of the big benefits was that she had a loving community who would just support her no matter what. And this was, you know, this was for her something that she couldn't or felt she couldn't get any other way, which I find very, very sad. Um, I, it's, it is, it does sadden me when I see that, um, someone like Becky Percy, I have no idea what motivates her. She seems to be angry with her parents, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but she claims that her parents who live in Holland are by all accounts, quite normal people, you know, subjected her to all sorts of crazy things like being chased through the woods in Hull, um, and you know in the middle of the night and but and yet somehow for some reason they put a camera on her head and a light so that she could record where she was going i don't really understand that um but it was you know it, it's that kind of thing like it's very hard to know exactly what motivates some of them for some of them it's definitely profit absolutely some naming no names but rhymes with wower wisney um she uh, has changed her story so often and it morphs from super soldier to MK ultra asset to, you know, one thing or another. And lately it's been SRA survivor. Um, and I think again, it's profit has something to do with that.
So the, the thing is, when you do call these people out, you do get savaged. I mean, for example, um, I've been through much savagery prior to you starting your blog. I I came out with the Holly Greg. Um, this is this is a hoax. I actually went to some of the most um, known proponents of this hoax, being the UK column, and I said to them, "Please look at the evidence." Brian Garrett refused to look at the evidence. And what he did then was, I mean, I was absolutely savage. He then goes to David Ike and complains to David Ike that I'm giving him a hard time, and you know, I'd had a rough time with David Ike previously over a different matter. So the two of them team up. David Ike writes a very nasty piece about me in his book, and sends the book all the way to my mom who lives in South Africa. Bearing in mind, I live with my husband in Holland. So he writes nasty things about me and sends a book, DHL, right? To South Africa, so my mom can read all the nasty things he's read about me, yeah. he's written about me. I mean, this is the level to which people go to in order to savage anyone who discredits um, them or makes them look like a fool for having supported something. You know, it was actually David Icke who first published the story about Holly Gregg, which got so much traction. Yeah. It was, in fact, Robert Greene who went to David Icke and asked him to publish his story. And that's when everybody jumped on board the story. Mm -hmm. And I was still, you know, following David Icke's work religiously back then. And, you know, I, I looked at this and started to question it. And there was definitely some big holes in this particular story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I didn't find out about the Holy Greg thing until I'd been um, sort of looking into the Hampstead one for a, quite a while. It was, you know, I sort of thought it was peripheral. And then I began to realize that many of the same people were involved and many of the same people were pushing it. Funnily enough, not David Icke. He, it was on his, um, it, there was a big discussion group on his uh, forums, but he personally never said yay or nay about it, which makes me wonder, you know, what was happening behind the scenes to to make that, you know, because you know, that he would to have his support that would have that would have pushed it right over the edge in terms of um you know basically giving people a license to print money so. you know i think he actually got caught out with the holly greg thing and wasn't going to jump on board of this one um because he just I took holly greg at face value oh yeah that, that matches the narrative i've been talking about for so long i'm going to put that out as an example of something without actually checking the facts and unfortunately this is a common thing for david i can although you know, he's a purveyor of some truths mm -hmm. um he actually has made a lot of mistakes some of them very public embarrassments uh, embarrassments to himself or one of them claiming he was jesus it's not, it's not without flaw. There's a number of things which he has taken at face value. And he's, I mean, this one person he wrote about in his book, uh, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees. He sent me to meet this person. And when I got there, I was like, how did you make it into one of David Icke's books? I've never met such a foul person. Uh, every other word was a swear word or, or, or written. And, and he couldn't, you know, he was completely the whole time that I was there, completely stoned, um, you know, completely drunk and lived in a supposed house where there's lots of healing goes on. He had like two million rands worth of crystals because of course this was in South Africa, mm -hmm. two million rands of the crystals through his whole house. But I couldn't believe that David I rated this guy so highly. But David takes things at face value. He doesn't look into people as, and he just goes, oh, yeah, I take that, it, it backs my narrative. If it backs the narrative, then it's good, obviously. You know, um, and if it makes money, because the, the, then, we, then we go on to the, look at the, the counselors that push this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there's a huge amount of counselors who go around pushing um, satanic ritual abuse because guess what? They, they have a, a, a steady stream of people, whether they've created them or have now seized upon this as you know, the issue du jour to be pissed off, angry and hurt about. Yeah. There's a steady stream of people who bring them money. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of, as the people that I'm seeing on, on this list of counselors, I mean, this is just a, this is just a tiny, you know, taste of the numbers of people who are out there. But yeah, um, one of the, one of the things that you'll see is that one of the biggest weapons that they will use when they want to go against someone who has uh, negated their claims is you are one of them. You're a Satanist. The number, if I had a dollar for every time I've been called a Satanist, I would be a rich woman. It's like, it's, 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 that's what they do to, be, to try to discredit their opponents is say, you're an abuser, you're a Satanist, you've done this, you've done that. Um, most recently, Angela Power Disney is trying to claim that I 
trained at the Allen Institute in Montreal. I'm pretty sure she doesn't have any idea how big Canada is because Montreal is a good two hour drive from where I live currently and where I did my uh, training as a social worker. It would have been a bit of a commute. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just because you live in Canada doesn't mean that you that everyone goes to the same place. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, when talking about Canada, uh, we have a focus on Sandra Fett because you know Sandra Fett is a Canadian therapist who came up when you were doing your uh, reporting mm -hmm. on the whole Hampstead trial for Sabine. Yeah. And Sandra has been um, was mentioned by Sabine in your reporting of the of the court case and in her testimony yeah. as one of the people who um, gave life to the whole SRA claim. She yeah. was categorically mentioned in the court hearings um, as that person. Mm -hmm. Now Sandra is the one who 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 taught Carl Dawson, who trained him or gave him the idea of matrix reimprinting therapy. Sandra's told us that she she made this therapy up. She's actually mm -hmm. made up the therapy, matrix reimprinting therapy, passed it on to Carl Dawson. Carl Dawson in turn trained Joe Lomax. Mm -hmm. Joe Lomax was a therapist on our um, network who used our network for two years, okay, paid us for production services, but what she did was it was a place where she and she told us it was a marketing expense for her, a place mm -hmm. for her to market herself so that she could get clients to give them therapy. And how does she do that? She obviously interviews people who've supposedly been ritually abused. Um, and this little circle is very incestuous. So I think what I really want to do, Biggie, uh, is perhaps go on to the flow chart. If you can take mm -hmm. us through it so you can see how these people link into each other. Joe Lomax had so many interesting people on our network, a great majority of them complete and utter frauds, and many of them involved with the Hampstead case. Joe Lomax brought all these different people up. And they've all been guests on the network. We've done a production for that. These are all very familiar people to those who follow your work, Karen. They all work together. They all do the conferences together in London where they teach others yeah. their lies. Can I can I pop in here quickly, Biggie? I just oh. want, these these are the ones. These are not all the people that Joanne Lomax interviewed on Network, but it's it's a broad selection um, of people, and all of them. I have big question marks behind them. Um, why they're doing what they're doing? The legitimacy of what they're doing, and also, of course, money and fame. Um, this is largely to do with ego and enrichment. Mm -hmm. For many of these people, a couple of them we've actually, um, you know, done a lot much deeper digging into. For example, um, when Joe Lomax bought Seven on to our network, we were contacted by uh, Joe. Actually, bought Seven on three times. We told her off the first time she bought Seven on. Listen, we, we just simply do not believe Seven's story. Joe insisted on bringing Seven on a further three times, and we were contacted by a gentleman by the name of Richard Hanna. Or at least we contacted him because he sent Joe Lomax a cease and desist order because Richard Hannell was accused by Seven of all sorts of things without any evidence to back up any of the things that she said about him. Mm -hmm. um, another one that we, Joe brought on, which caused a tremendous amount of trouble, uh, was a gentleman by the name of Dean Oliver who lives here in the Algarve with us, mm -hmm. selling very low quality CBD oil um, and providing fake test certificates from it, having sourced it from a dodgy place. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a number of people who have suffered um, as a result of Dean Oliver. He spent uh, in and out of jail for 10 years uh, due to theft and armed robbery um, because he was supporting a heroin addiction and then decided he was the, you know, the new found Jesus to heal everyone of cancer and started supplying very dodgy CBD oil with less than 1% CBD whilst claiming it had 10% and, and pushing fake test certificates on his website. And we exposed all of this. Yeah, and this is the really thing, cool. one of the key patterns I wanna point out with all these people, even if you bring them you know, scientific evidence, tests, we had the oils tested, okay? And we, should, we brought Joe Lomax the evidence. We said to her, look, this is the evidence. This is the person who got onto the network. This is the trouble he's causing. And this the evidence, you know, hardcore provable evidence of tests of products. She wouldn't look at anything which contradicted her narrative, which is, you know, I'm a healer. I'm going to bring people on who I think are either victims or healers or healing people of SRA or curing cancer or doing this. Or, or, 
without actually having looked deeper into who they are and what they're actually doing. If they were good enough to back up her narrative of who she was, if they could support her external locus of identity, she was going to give them airtime because that airtime was basically a marketing tool for her to get clients. And, you know, that marketing tool was costing her. So the moment you come to her and go, well, actually, you know, um, that person isn't so good, you know, it hurts them because they've paid to have that person on. She's paying us for production services. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to feel that they somehow contributed financially to, to um, or, or deficited financially or, or been a fool and, and spent money promoting people that really they shouldn't have promoted. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very hard thing for people to have to admit. And the simple fact is with Joe Lomax, there were just so many of them, so many very questionable people mm -hmm. that in the end, it was few and far between um, in terms of who she had brought on that wasn't, um, you know, big question marks behind them. I mean, you can see a few people here, Wilfred Wong, uh, where's the other one? John Wedger. Mm -hmm. All of these people are very questionable. We've had direct dealings with some of them. Silas Lease, also um, someone who's trying to do this whole, I'm suing the banks, I don't want to pay my mortgage, I'm going to sue them because they're doing things illegally. Yeah. Um, and really just a man who didn't want to pay his bills, a big con artist, you know, he ran, he's, he's, he's uh, had how many businesses go bankrupt because the banks are trying to seize his house and he's going to sue them because everything they're doing is corrupt and illegal. That may very well be true, yeah. but no, what yeah, I get the impression of, right. Through working with them, um, what we've got the impression of, this is just someone who doesn't want to pay his bills, yeah. bottom line. And now he's going to sue the banks and he wants to free be right. No, we all have to work, we all have to pay bills. It's reality, it's the nature of this reality. We may not like it, but that's the way it is. Capitalism pretty much sucks, but it's what we've got at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely. And unfortunately, it perhaps is the pernicious backbone which motivates a lot of these people because everybody needs to make money. That's but, the ironic thing. It's, it's capitalism that is driving them in the first place, which is kind exactly. of funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, someone like Anne Riddles, who claims to make 15,000 euros um, per speaking event, for mm -hmm. example, right? Um, speaking about satanic ritual abuse. And I can categorically tell you she's made that story up because she's made up so many stories. I mean, and if you challenge her, she throws that thing, as you said, back at her, um, back at you. They go, oh, there's something wrong with you. She would say, every time Biggie challenged her, she'd go, you remind me of my father who used to abuse me. Yeah. 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 Or you must, or the other one, the other iteration of that, oh, you must be a satanic ritual abuse person if you question me. Mm-hmm. You know, they throw this back at you. Yeah. There's um, this very pernicious undertone for all these people. Now, you can see how all these people tie into each other. Um, they're all linked. Um, all of them kind of um, support each other's narrative. And I just, you know, none of them actually seem to want to admit that there's something wrong here. Even recently, David Ike was pushing John Wedger, who's supposedly a police officer who's been involved in investigating a number of different um, aspects of um, ritual abuse. And then the police have come out and said, you know, he never, even when he was an officer, filed one single thing. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. There's a lot of question around this guy, John Wedger, and he's attached to a whole bunch of interesting people who are attached to, you know, the various hoaxes that you've exposed via your blog. Mm -hmm. The thing is that all these people have a lot to, to account for. Most of them, if they believe um, this narrative, they haven't done the research, or there's some kind of financial incentive for them, or even some kind of egoic incentive for them, a building of a marketable external locus of identity, either um, some uh, deep-set narcissistic need to be a messiah. There's a lot of um, theme of messiah complex mm -hmm. coming through with these people. Mm -hmm. I'm a healer, don't question me. When we spoke to um, Sandra Fecht, you know, it was very much, you know, I've been a therapist for this many years. I've got my degree, I've got my master's degree, and I created this therapy. And, you know, why should we be questioning her? Because mm -hmm. she's created this therapy. We must just accept that because she's got so many years of experience behind her, it's okay to make up a therapy where you're implanting memories into people's heads. Yeah. And Sandra actually lost the license because yes. of it. That's right. She um, lost her license to practice in, to, she lost the license um, to call herself a psychotherapist in Ontario, which is the province where she practices. I was a little bit puzzled because she, her, the town where she lives is Aurelia, which is, I don't know, about four hours 
drive from here ish um from 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 where i lived in auto in, in ottawa and she um uh she basically claimed that uh she was still getting business and i'm i'm finding that amazing like how was she managing to get people coming up from toronto to a little tiny town of maybe about i think it's 30 it's either 35 or 65,000 either way a very small town in ontario that is far away from everything it's far from toronto it's you know all the big centers um so and you were saying that she does most of this online which i think is very interesting um that she does that, that that's how people are getting around these kinds of um you know blocks on their on their practice yeah, international. She just uh, treats clients via video conferencing like this. It's yeah. made the world more connectable. Mm -hmm. um, she can do international and treat outside of Canada. But when, whilst treating people inside of Canada, instead of calling a therapist delivering therapy, she calls herself a consultant a giving a consultation. Yeah. And apparently um, clients in Canada have to sign a waiver that they agree to the therapy. And that's how she can continue to operate. And mm -hmm. I think for vulnerable people, not, there's a lot of, I've realized, you know, not bigging myself up, that I've actually become really savvy. And there's a lot of very naive people out there who unfortunately don't understand the ins and outs of this stuff. And I don't blame them. I mean, we've had a network where we've had the opportunity to view so many things, so many people interconnected to each other and to get a, such a broad spectrum that we've been able to establish clear, firm patterns. We go, whoa, hang on. This is, this is pointing to a bigger picture that's actually um you know it's, it's quite disturbing because mm -hmm. there is there is yes i agree there are people who are abused i think there are people who are victims of cults i do believe that there is such oh, a thing as satanism mm -hmm. but to say that um absolutely every claim of satanic ritual abuse that that comes out is a legitimate claim and that we should all just jump on the bandwagon and support these people and send money to these people and buy into therapists to claim to be able to erase these traumatic experiences mm -hmm. even if they don't exist by implanting false memories and a lot of the time the false memories are in fact um geared towards making people believe that they've had some kind of cult ritual abuse experience which you know they may have just been abused by their parents mm -hmm. and they've just had experienced um certain things which they now want to draw attention to but they lie about it to make it um grab more attention from people to make it more yeah. marketable in terms of bringing money in yeah well it's the classic snake oil salesman thing that is invent a false narrative and a, a problem that needs to be solved sell it to people claim that the that you know that, that this problem is you know, widespread and that you you know that 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 person your your client is say a survivor of whatever um and then claim to have the tools to fix it and then you've got yourself a never-ending cycle of money basically you know yeah. you've got people coming in saying um, you know, oh, I don't remember what happened to me in childhood, but I feel kind of shitty. Next thing you know, they go out with, oh, I remember my grandfather, you know, was, was the head of a satanic cult and he did this, that, and the other. And when you remember, when you quote unquote, remember those things, uh, then you're locked into the relationship with the therapist for the foreseeable future it's basically a license for the therapist to print money yeah you know yeah. and they have and it and it creates a dependence that is the exact opposite of what a good therapist should be trying to do which is to create the independent help the help the client find their own independence and go off into the world with it rather than remaining stuck in the in the client therapy role yeah know? absolutely this is so many familiar names here um it's <laughs> way to go next <laughs> it is really really interesting how they all seem to be engaged in this kind of circular um promotion of one another's work i first remember seeing sandra fecht's work for example uh when the satanic thing was first being mooted about with uh, with the Hampstead hoax and i think she was doing an interview I do remember thinking, what the hell is that Canadian lady doing there? Um, and who is she and why have I never heard of her? 
And the answer to that is, well, that's because I didn't know very much about the, you know, the, the SRA recovered memories community. Um, and so that was like, that was five, you know, almost five years ago now. And, but it's interesting because th there's so many links, for instance, Rainer Kurtz, he does have a doctorate. I do know that it has nothing to do with uh, being a therapist who can somehow draw forth memories of you know of from you know from from the hit you know from the hidden depths of the psyche i think he's oh it's an occupational therapist um psychiatrist psychologist rather i think i think that's what i remember seeing about him but in any case um and i don't want to be misspeaking about mr kurtz although i understand that he um, he likes to promote himself, so maybe he won't mind the mention. Um, John Wedger, again, I think is a dangerous person. I think he, I don't know whether he believes the stuff that he says. His story does seem to change over time. And I know that he actually seems to have been a police officer because we found, you know, some he, he, he was cited in some cases from you know ten or ten or twelve years ago, he first came to my attention again via the Hampstead hoax because he was he had received um, the Ella's hit list from uh, I believe from Bill Maloney, and he sent it off to his friends at the police department. I imagine he still had friends there um, who that he felt he could confide in, saying you know, that he'd received this and, and thought it was, you know, strange. Uh, and could they please look into it? And it wound up coming back to the investigating officer in the Hampstead hoax, who had already received the identical list, maybe three weeks earlier from Ella. And this was their tip off, I guess, that that Ella and Abraham were using the hoax and that this was their plan to use the hoax as an online marketing tool. Um, so he basically confirmed for the police exactly what the hoax was all about, even though they had already by that time taken the children into protective care because they'd said that Abraham was hitting them. So, so that's, that was my first, you know, encounter with, with Wedger. And then he just kind of popped up again, I guess at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, sort of popped up again in, in an interview with, um, I think it was Luke Collins, uh, talking about his magnificent career as a whistleblower. Um, again, there's very little evidence to show that that's the case. Interesting point. Everybody wants to be a whistleblower. Everybody wants to be a hero. So if it's not for making money, mm -hmm. and if it's not because they've got a messiah complex, they want to be a healer, they want to be a hero. Yeah. So they're a whistleblower. Yeah. And you know, yeah, that's what I think maybe um, people like Robert Greene thought he was, okay, was, was a bit of a hero. Mm -hmm. doing this thing that he did for Anne and Holly, and in the end he retracted everything and went to, he went to jail. When he came out of jail, regretted much of it and retracted a whole bunch of stuff and it's very much the same how we see um shane Pusser being in jail and i do i do feel sorry for the lady being there she's um, an older lady it's sad to have to spend uh, some of her older years there but she herself i think saw herself as a bit of a hero you know oh, yeah, very children. Much. that's what she got out of it yeah financial perhaps but that's that's the ultimate thing everybody i think people don't want to believe that you know their life is just dull and boring they want to believe they've contributed in some way mm -hmm. to helping make the world a better place and although it's a very noble aspiration it's somewhat misguided in that sometimes we champion things that we probably should have looked into a bit deeper before we jumped on board that supposed hero bandwagon oh yeah let's go whistleblow and make a noise and get this out there mm -hmm. hang on a second whose lives are being destroyed in the process and is what's being said really the truth yeah well and there's cherry picking and the whole gamut of ways that people can fool themselves into believing that something is true simply by only ever looking at the evidence that seems to support what you're saying um and and ignoring everything else even when it's yes. brought to your attention and that that to me is a key if someone brings something to my attention and says you're wrong about this because and shows me actual evidence that i'm wrong about something 
I'm totally on board. I've done that many times. You know, there are, you know, for instance, with when I first realized that, you know, satanic ritual abuse was that many of the people claiming it are making it up. I would, I would have, you know, been horrified to realize that at the very beginning. But once I began to look at some of the actual evidence, very, very poignant what you're saying there, Karen, because of course this is the most important thing um, that people need to realize is the pattern of information, okay? The common patterns, the common traits yeah. of these people is they're, the refusal, unable to provide supporting evidence to the claims, despite the fact that they want to use these claims for some kind of uh, public narrative, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, unwilling to keep an open mind and um, they will not look at any evidence that contradicts their external locus of identity, their supposed narrative or beliefs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is very, very common. And this is the thing that I think it's the common thread that goes through all of them. For example, when I said to Angela Power Disney, OK, so you, 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 you want to push the, the Hampstead case and you believe the Holly's version of the Holly Grigg case. OK. Mm -hmm. How about you just have a chat to Sylvia Major and Windragon Smith. Just, just get into a conversation with these ladies and hear them out. Mm -hmm. okay? She refused. When I went to Joe Lomax and I said, okay, all right, so you've had seven on three times. You've now received a cease and desist order mm -hmm. from Richard Hanna. Mm -hmm. We've spoken to Richard Hanna and I suggest just have a chat to him to understand his side of things. Because, you know, you're, you're, you're providing airtime, which you're paying for, to mm -hmm. a lady. You've done it three times, the lady being seven, who's making very, very hectic claims about this guy. Yeah. You not at least want to hear his side of the story. She absolutely refused to speak to him mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. knowing anything about him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I, I totally agree with him sending her a cease and desist order. This is why we reached out to him going, look, we provide the service. We're not supporting the story. We don't necessarily yeah. believe Seven's story. And, I, and we want to hear from you, like what you have to say. So we as a network, we did our due diligence and we, we, we counseled him and we gave him advice and we spoke to him about, you know, what goes on in the alternative media world and really orientated him because he knew nothing about any of this. He didn't even know what the Hoaxstead blog was all about. Mm -hmm. We explained everything to him and that there are these hoaxes out there and it's quite a common thing and you know, he's been caught up in something that's much bigger. Mm -hmm. We really counseled him, but he, he, was, he was like shocked and just through experiencing his naivety and his amazement some of the stuff, we realized that this guy really doesn't have what it takes to do the things that... Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's been accused of. He's not a nefarious character. He's actually pretty straight down the line. And yeah. um, we gave him a fair hearing and gave him our ears and we, we balanced, we weighed up the information. We just were like, we believe that, you know, because Joe Lomax had bought seven on three times, she should at least, even if she didn't do a recorded interview, at least speak mm -hmm. to Richard Hanna. Mm -hmm. And there was a refusal there. Yeah. And there's yeah. this pattern, and she's probably the most obvious one for us. Hers was the most obvious pattern for me throughout this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that when I came to her with people who were absolutely causing harm and loss through their actions, through their media activity, and we could provide pure categoric evidence or someone who's willing to give her first, their first hand account, which might contradict what she knew. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah flatly shut it down, refused even to consider the evidence. And in the end, I believe she said she was going to let God decide. <laughs> How does God do that, pray tell? <laughs> you know, so it, it's, this is, this is what we're dealing with. You know, who might have said, well, you know, are you really going to let God decide? Or are you going to use your common sense? You know, just, mm. just look at the evidence. Maybe God is trying to tell you and you're just not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, but that's an easy way out, you know, and then it's a classic one. It's the same as if you dare to question SRA, oh, you must be someone involved in SRA. It's the same as if you yeah. dare to question God, you must be on the side of the devils, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's this whole, what do you yeah. say when they throw that at you, you know, you're going to let God decide, oh, okay. Yeah. You, you, say, go, you be stupid. Arguing further, that's what you yeah. say, and then you move it's, on. <laughs> that's down the <laughs> argument completely. So, yeah. there is, and you get this with Angela Power Disney as well. She's a, she's a, she's a bad Christian also, she claims. Um, mm -hmm. And she also will throw in the religious narrative. Same thing with uh, your and my friend both, Hope Girl. Oh, God. Come yeah. with this heavy religious narrative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you say anything against it, you know, then you're a Satanist because you're, you're not a believer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's pretty difficult to kind of come up against that and come up looking anyway.
um, yeah, smelling well, like roses, which is why I decided long ago just to back away from all the ugliness and the fighting. I don't have to be a part of this, but what I will be is an open-minded observer, keeping mm -hmm. true to my journalistic principles, which is there has to be supporting evidence. No matter how much your heart may want to believe something or feel sorry for someone or want to help them, mm -hmm. if there's no supporting evidence, unfortunately, you have to take the hard stance of going, well, you know, this may not necessarily be true. No, and I think a lot of people, I think, for example, Hope Girl is a good example of someone who adopts um, certain the, quote, religious beliefs or, or religious, the trappings of religious belief as a sales gimmick. You know, recently now, she's now a quote unquote targeted individual, although I've never seen anyone targeting her. Um, she seems to think I do, but I can't really be bothered with her. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that when you're, you, you find what your audience wants to hear and then you claim to be a really, really good one. Thomas Dunn, another point. If he's a Christian, I'm an artichoke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, Karen. Uh, and and we've, I must just say, Hope is masterful. One of the things I enjoyed working with her when she was, when she was on our network was she was very good at what she does. She's mm -hmm. a thorough professional, but she's also very good at twisting everything to her advantage. Yeah. And when I realized, now I thought I was good, but when I realized, I, when I, I, there's no point going up against someone who is this malevolent because, mm -hmm. you know, the only way you beat them is to sink to their level. Yep. And I just simply wasn't prepared to do that. No, that's right. And I, I, that's why I withdrew from it. It's just like, well, there's no point. You go ahead and do your thing. And if the God that you believe in thinks you're right, I'm sure he, she, or it will reward you. <laughs> Let me know. Yeah. 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 All right, so anything else you want to put to this, Karen? I think we've covered most of what we wanted to cover, if I recall, and what we set out to do. Um, again, I think it's it's been a really, really interesting experience. Um, as you say, kind of stepping over the line and, and um, you know, shaking hands with people that we thought were our enemies. Um, it's It's been a very interesting experience, and I really wanted to thank you for that, because you were the one who reached out, and I appreciated it. Mm -hmm.